this is not going well for black people. So, so is the case in Matthew 22 and it's similar passages in the other Gospels. Jesus asks the Pharisees a question. What do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? See? So they, the Pharisees, respond to him, the son of David. Now it says Christ here, Christos, it means Mashiach. Okay? So Jesus, we are told, asks these religious Jews, Orthodox rabbis, whose son is the Mashiach? Where does Mashiach come from? He says the descendant of King David. Now, so far, if someone asks, who is Mashiach, whose son is he, we was end of, any religious Jew would answer that he's a great-great-grandson of King David, which he has to be. Incidentally, when these, when Matthew and Luke claim that Jesus is born to a virgin, he can no longer be the descendant of King David because he doesn't have a human Jewish father with which to transmit that tribal. All right, I'm gonna kind of pause it for there, guys. And uh, let, me get, let, me, let me get started here. Figure out, ah. there we go. All right, Dave, me and you are addressed the same. Tonight, but I got a pocket. I don't know if you got a pocket or not. <laughs> oh gosh! All right, got the same hairdo, almost the same beard. You're just missing the sides. So look at there. Ron would have one too. Give him time. He's gonna grow one too. <laughs> mm. All right. I, here's what I want to do with you guys here. Thank you for coming tonight, too. I appreciate that. Um, what kind of inspired me to do this message is, you know, I, I, every so often I do these messages to refute Tobia Singer. Uh, and I know Tobia. Not like we know each other as best friends or nothing, but me and Tobia corresponded for years and years and years and years. He said to me one time, he said, I won't debate you because I don't know how to defeat you. <laughs> so... I, I don't, I don't know. He probably could in some cases because he's pretty smart. If you're going to, if you're debating, you've got to really know everything. I don't know everything. When he speaks about a specific subject and he's quoting uh, and claiming all the mistakes that everybody makes or Jesus makes or whatever, he's, you really have to do some serious research to, to see where he's made the mistake. And in this particular passage here, he's basically, and I'm going to let me go back to share the screen here. Um, what, what he's doing is he's arguing, uh, let's see here, going back. He's going back to Psalm. Uh, let's see here. I may have actually taken on this issue before already. I don't remember if I did this one or not. Uh, and he's arguing about that this, yeah, I do, I, I do remember him. I do remember do, doing this before a bit as well, where he's talking about a, a song, let's see, uh, to David, because I wasn't paying attention to what he said there, but uh, let me go back to that part there real quick. Right here, let me play this part here. The Lord said to my Lord, the Lord means God, said to my Lord. Remember, the people who are speaking are not David. So, and by sharing with you that Psalm 110 begins differently than other Psalms that have that in Kippet, meaning Psalm 23. I only select that because it's the most famous song, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But if you, it begins with Mizmar Ludovit, Mizmar Ludovit, which is translated in Psalm 23 variously as a song of David, Mizmar Ludovit, a song of David, which means David HaMelech is the author. Okay, very simple. Now, those of you who 
have even a superficial knowledge of the Hebrew language, you do need a superficial knowledge. This is not organic chemistry. This is not, this is first year biblical Hebrew. This is, this really is rudimentary. What is the David Mizmar mean? It doesn't mean of David a song, but rather it means a song, led David to David a song. What does that mean? This is a soliloquy. This is a song to David. The Lord said to my Lord, the Lord means God, said to my Lord. Remember, the people who are speaking are not David. So Matthew 22 is a lie. The people who are speaking in Psalm 110, but rather... All right, I want to correct one thing we'll start off with here to begin with. The the uh, first letter in there... Uh, it looks like the number seven backwards, I guess. Uh, that is a lamed. A lamed can mean two or four either way. So it could be for David, Mizmor, a song, for David, a song, or like in the case over here, uh, a, a song for David. It can, it can literally be either way because of that. To David, yes, you can translate it that way. Notice over here, uh, he translates it here of David. And yet he's using the, the Lamed letter there. So that's interesting. He doesn't bring that out to you that he's translating the, the Lamed differently. He's just using the English language to make it look that way. A Psalm of David. Or a, or So if you're going to stay consistent, you're going to say like in this case here, to David a Psalm, then why not say uh, a Psalm to David? It'd still be the same thing, still mean the same thing. But the Lamed can also mean for, et cetera. There's a lot of different ways that it could actually mean there. Uh, it's just a loose loose way of translating. It's not like the letter hey, which is a definite article, and it'd be a little bit different in the way you would translate it then. But really, though, what's fascinating to me about this is when you get into this, uh, and, and I'm going to take you over to the Hebrew Matthew to look at it, uh, where Jesus quotes this same thing. Um, and he says here, he said to them, uh, let's see, the Pharisees assembled, uh, and Jesus asked them, saying, what is your opinion? Hang on one second here. Oh. I'll move this down so make sure we got room here to see uh, everything. He says, um, back up here. What is your opinion concerning the Messiah? Whose son will he be? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it that David, by the Holy Spirit, called him, saying, Lord? Now, if you'll notice, he, he says, Lord, right? Because his argument here, and uh, let's see. I have to keep moving in there around because in order to be able to get the screen to work, let me go put it over there. And verse 43, here it is right here. Uh, let's see. Baruch HaKadosh Lemod Adon. All right. So he says here, how is it that David by the Holy Spirit called him saying, Lord? Now, for first, the first thing you want to look at, he is, Jesus clearly in the Hebrew language uses Adon or Adonai. And Adon means master. Now he tries to, Atovia is trying to make this more as if like in modern Hebrew, uh, yeah, they do say Ken Adonai, uh, which basically would translate yes, sir. Uh, not necessarily yes, master, but yes, sir. That's the way they've allowed the word Adon to become used in modern Hebrew. But the more specific purpose that Jesus is speaking about here is, one, he's saying by the, the, the Holy Spirit, he says this. So even if you want to go back and do, do the little fancy uh, thing that he's, that he's showing you there, being whether it be a psalm to David or, uh, or a, a song by David, so to speak, 
Uh, that's perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong with that because that's what Jesus is saying too. He's actually telling you that David got that song by the Holy Spirit. So yes, it is God gave him this psalm to, to actually speak about. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever, all right? But let's look at what he's saying here because this is the important aspect that Toby has totally, he's got people so messed up and I kind of get, I get, I get his point though, you know, because in, in, in modern day Christianity, most people look at that when they're hearing, you know, where, you know, why does the, the Lord say in the spirit, he says to David, you know, um, and let's just go to Psalm 110 real quick here. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Okay. Uh now, if you'll notice, this, and by the way, Mamre Mechon is actually a Jewish translation of this Bible verse here. And if you'll notice, they say a psalm of David, not to David a psalm. Interesting. Even though Tovia is pointing out the differences with uh, Psalm 23, and, and there's, like I said, there's nothing wrong with it, because in reality, to David, a psalm would be more accurate. I agree with him on that. And, and the reason why, because it is, as Jesus says in the Hebrew Matthew, it, he said it by the Holy Spirit. So yes, God actually gives him the song and it is God speaking through him, saying to him, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And he, and now Tobia doesn't disagree that it's talking about the Messiah, he doesn't disagree with that at all, but he's trying to take that little Lord over there. If it's no big deal, just some kind of little, little, you know, modern day, you know, just a kid or something like that. But the point that, that Jesus is making when he's saying this is that a father does not speak of his child as a master, because in Hebrew, it means master. And even for God, by the Holy Spirit, like Jesus says, by the Holy Spirit, he is saying to him, you know, he calls him Lord or Master. Even, even the Heavenly Father who knows all things and everything would not dare speak of the Son of David as his Master. Now, I'll prove to you about the seriousness of this, because he kind of, like I said, he kind of tries to make it look like, oh, it's no big deal. Uh, that's only, that's 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 just being used as a sir, or like in the English people, they call each other lords. Um, this, and, there, and there's many, many, many places here where we could do this. I just want to use this one as an example. This here, in this fragment here, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, one cube uh, uh uh, this is from the book of Micah. The Lord uh, will be a witness. And of course, that the Lord Yahweh will be a witness, a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, Yahweh leaves his place. All right. Now notice. And we could actually let me pull up Micah one real quick, just out of curiosity. We'll pull it up over there too. It's probably going to be the exact same. Okay. Let's see now. Now let me go back to the Hebrew version of this real quick. There's it. Two to five. Let's see if it's. We'll just see if it corresponds. Yeah, right here. And let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his temple. Okay. And here it is right here in Hebrew. Adoni Yehovah. Bechem le'ed. Adoni. Again. Mehayachal Kadosho. From his holy temple. All right. So in double cases there. You have Adoni there, you have Adoni there. And 
in this case here, it, it means God, you know, it means Lord, it means the master, the master Jehovah, Bechem Laed, okay, be a witness against you. And again, uh, from his from his holy temple. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, I think it's actually a little different there. We have, okay, okay, Lord, never mind. No, it's still, it's still, it's worded the same way. For behold, Yahweh leaves his place and descends upon the heights of the earth. So the point is, is that even in Psalm 110, when we're reading here, the Lord said unto my Lord, He's, he's, he's minimizing the Adoni here, making it look like eh, it's just a common everyday word, even modern Hebrew. Modern Hebrew did bring the word Lord down. Now, granted, Lord in Hebrew can also be applied to like the head archon or a devil because he is the master of the evil that he does. So, you know, I get that part there. I don't, I'm not, that's not really my argument at all in this here. But the argument is that you cannot change and you cannot twist around when he does this is that when we're looking at this from the, from the uh, New Testament and Jesus says, uh, he said to them, how is it David by the Holy Spirit called him saying, Lord, as it is written, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies uh, the footstool of your feet. If David calleth him Lord, how is he his son? Because you got to remember, Jesus does clearly identify that he's saying that by the Holy Spirit. So that's dealing with that issue of that for David or or, or the song, uh, the song being done by David, or is it a song for David? But it's still the fact that David is singing it, and the fact that even even for the even for God Himself to say it to Him, if it's David's son, why would then the Lord make His son His master? That's the that's the real point of what is being said here, and Tobia is just totally letting that go over the top of people's heads. Doesn't even care. And the thing is, though, is that's not what he's saying. He said they were not able to answer him a word. And from then on, they feared to ask him anything. You know, now Tobia just makes it like, you know, the Lord of Alley is no big deal. You know, oh, it just, you know, just means, you know, sir or something. You know, it's no big deal that David did that. And by the way, it was his great, 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 great grandson. They should have just been able to answer him like that. But the point is, is the prophecy speaks about David's son would sit upon his throne. Doesn't say his grandson, doesn't say his great, 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 great grandson or any of those things like that. It said his son is going to sit on the throne. And so even that in itself is a little bit more complex than what most people would think about. Um, but that was the one thing, that's why I wanted to kind of look at that and, and share that with you because there is so much that that is being done today that is just totally undermining um, the Christian faith as a result of, especially in Tobias' case, because he is so relentless at every little thing he can find, he's trying to totally unravel it. And I am watching Christians just drop like flies because they don't they don't know how to defend it. They don't know how to defend what they believe or understand what they believe. So that's just really troubling in itself. Um, so anyway, let me take and uh, if anybody you guys have any questions, ask. Let's we can we can discuss this a little bit. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to actually go over to. What is it, Daniel? And uh, because even though I just did this video on that, I am still really kind of blown away by what's written in the book of Daniel over here about this. And there again, that's another, I guess you'd call it a play on words. Um, because of the way things are translated, it's just absolutely fascinating um, to 
we're, we're not going to be very long tonight, but uh, like I said, but anyway, we're getting ready to head back to Tennessee in the morning, so I've got to get up like four o'clock, five o'clock, something like that. <clears throat> I, I want to do this with you guys because we're just right here together, and then that way, if you have questions about that, we can talk about this as well. We're, we're going back into this whole thing about this fourth beast. Uh, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And as for the 10 horns out of this kingdom, shall 10 kings arise and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the former and he shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And that's holy ones there um, of the Most High. That's right. Always covers everything up. There you go. That's a compound word there of the word holy uh, or holy ones. It's in the plural is why they call it holy ones or the way or why I translate it that way. Um, saints, you could say saints as well. That'd be more appropriate, maybe according to modern way of thinking. Uh, and uh, Elion is where, or Elonin, uh, is where you get it from the Most High. That's kind of the way that is translated out as well. And he shall think to change the seasons. Uh, the word Zaman right here in dark blue, that's the word literally in Hebrew means time. And then Biblical Hebrew back then didn't always translate with a mem sophit at the end. This one's got a nun sophit as feminine, uh, which is still pluralized. If you go back into the times of the Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll find that pluralization uh, is far more often than you do the modern for, uh, pluralization of a mem, the letter mem instead. So it still means the times. So he thinks to change the times, and again, they put on their law in, in the English, but the word dot right here is the word for decree. In Hebrew, the word law is Torah, just like you get from the what they call the five books of Moses, they call it the Torah. Uh, the Tanakh is what they call all the books together, and that's from an acronym of Torah, uh, which is the law, Kotavim, which is the writing, and then Navim, which are the prophets. But in the in in the book of Daniel here, we have this in the book of Daniel, we have it in the book of uh, Esther, and the book of uh, Ez, uh, Ez, Ezra, uh, because in, in each one of the cases there, the laws that it's speaking about, for the most part, are all dealing with what the king gives. Uh, now, there's one place, and I think it's in Ezra, where he uses it, and he refers to it where God makes a law, but it's not a law of the traditional sense. Again, it's just a decree that God had given or permitted is what it is. But other than that, you don't find this word used anywhere in the Old Testament at all. That word dot is specifically only in the, this area here. And uh, Esther, it makes sense for it to be in Esther, though, because you're dealing with uh, the king who is married to Vashti. Uh, she doesn't, she's not willing to come out with him. He ends up marrying Esther. Later, he finds out that Esther is Jewish. And of course, they're, they're making this uh, edict in order to kill every, all the Jews. So the king puts out a decree that they have a right to defend themselves because he was tricked into putting out a decree that allowed them to be slaughtered. So in this case there, he changes that over and he puts out, a, or at least gives a decree to where they're able to defend themselves. Uh, now that's a good example. Esther is a very good example of this. Um, let, me, let me see if I can. Hmm. It's probably too much time to try to, to pull it up to bring it out exactly what I wanna say. What I want to, what I'm trying to get you to see on the, on the, in the case of Esther, is that the king gives a, he does give a decree, because Haman tricks him into that decree, which would allow the slaughter of the Jews in all the provinces. 
Then what does the king do, though? When the king finds out that that decree, which could not be revoked, he has to give a different kind of decree at the bidding of Esther, and that is for the Jews to be able to defend themselves. So in that case, he doesn't technically change his decree, but he has to change it to somewhat in order for them to be able to fight back and, and not be plundered. All right. In the case of Daniel, though, the decree that goes forth here, or when it's talking about here that he thinks that he can change the season and the law, is because Cyrus, uh, and going back from, uh, you have Artaxerxes, Caesar, Darius, and Cyrus, but they had already given this decree in order for the Jews to be able to return to their homeland. And not just the Jews. It actually, if you, I've actually seen the Cyrus cylinder myself over in Europe, where they have it on display. And in that cylinder, you know what's written on there is that for all the peoples of their lands, we're going to be able to go back to their homeland. But in, in Israel's case, it's also to rebuild their temple. And and what's it for? It's for the coming of the Messiah. So when we're we we see that that's the decree that is given by uh, Cyrus, and of course, uh, they're, they're, they're going to bring about this order. And of course, that's, I think that's, I forget the exact order of how that worked out. But anyway, the Jews do return home. Uh, we know that Ezra is part of that uh, in, in, in putting together this coalition. They're going back. They start to rebuild the temple. They have to have a sword in one hand and a and a trial in the other hand, while they're while they're sitting there, as we know, building the temple and the walls and and restoring Jerusalem, etc. But there's going to come a kingdom upon the earth that is going to be so wicked, so diverse from all the other times, and that particular kingdom thinks that they can change the season and that decree. So in reality, what we're seeing here is that someone is going to try to alter the time frame and the decree that was first given for the Jews to return to their homeland. So, all right, so what am I saying here? If you go then to the fact that Jesus comes, he's rejected by the Jews 2,000 years ago. Uh, they have him hung on a cross. They begin to hunt down all the believers. And the next thing you know, just as Jesus says, there's not going to be one stone here left upon another that will not be thrown down. And that's exactly what happens. All those stones are thrown down. 70 AD, Titus comes in, just like in the case of Babylon, wipes it all out and sends them back into exile again. And then we have... Uh, 2,000 years later, nearly, not quite, but nearly 2,000 years later, the Jewish people begin to try to return back to the homeland. And as they're coming back this time, they're trying, they want to rebuild the third temple. And so it's obvious that Daniel foresaw this and he calls it a beast kingdom, you know, right here, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, upon earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms. And that's exactly what we end up having here. And so I, I point out the beast part because, you know, you go back to where Jesus called the Pharisees serpents and vipers. And then today, Nehemiah Gordon says that you can't be a uh, Orthodox uh, rabbi unless you can prove that you're a descendant of the Pharisees, which I kind of find ironic. So then it would make more sense why it's a beast kingdom uh, in, in that regards there. But the strange thing is, even though he is thinking to change the times and the law, they shall be given into his hand until a time's time and a half a time. So he's going to get it anyway. And that seems to, if it says that it's going to be given into his hand, that inevitably, in my opinion, means that they'll build that third temple. 
doesn't mean that it's of God, but they'll, they'll be able to pull it off. But the judgment shall sit, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and to be destroyed and to the end. So they'll get it built, but then it's all going to come to destruction. And we go on to read, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey them. So that's speaking about, you know, the, the believers that uh, with standing with Christ. But, and, and here's what's interesting, right? If you think about this. It has to be taken away because if not, that would then then the what Christ promised that we would rule and reign with him in heavenly places, then th his kingdom would not stand. There would be no kingdom. And of course, now we are that temple, not we don't need a physical building because we ourselves make up the true temple. And that's the beauty of it there. And so it says in the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. Their kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts much have frightened me and my countenance was changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Even Daniel doesn't know what to do with it. But that's what it comes down to. And if you think about it, that's really the challenge to Christianity today is the fact that Israel in their own dominance on the world stage have changed the law, changed the time frame of what was originally decreed by Cyrus and they're applying it to the modern time frame. And, and, and the other thing is too, this is the reason why they're going to stamp out or at least try to stamp out the faith in Jesus Christ. This is why when they did the uh, the, uh, the 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 they passed the anti-Semitic bill. As I played for you there, Chuck Baldwin quoting another uh, minister, you know they've criminalized portions of the New Testament. In effect, with what they're doing. And in reality, the reason why they're doing all these things is because if they don't, how are they going to get how are they going to get authority to be able to declare to the world that this is fulfillment of scripture? When it's not, but they still, for a time, they're going to pull it off. And of course, as you see, we already saw in there. Um, he shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. I mean, think of that. The whole earth, one little bitty nation. And, and this is, I don't like this. I don't, I don't like to say this in speaking against the Jewish people that are there because for the most part, Jewish people have no desire to do these things or to, uh, see such evils perpetrated on other people on the earth, they would rather just coexist with people. But when you're dealing with this minority that can control the government, I mean, look, look at what's happened in Israel. To, you know, uh, Before October the 7th, there was so much unrest in Israel about this judicial reform going on. And, and the judicial reform is so that they can make Israel a monarchy. Instead of a democracy, they want to turn it into a monarchy. Because if they're going to, to create this um, idea that David is now ruling on the throne in Jerusalem, They've got to create a monarchy. Now, if you, in fact, even if you look, there's, uh, uh, I think it's considered an apocryphal book, but it's uh, the Apocalypse of Peter, I think is what where the book speaks about, actually literally talks about how that they would come with a false messiah and set this up. And he goes, 
it's almost verbatim if you were to take it and kind of look at what you're reading here in Daniel, it's very similar uh, in the way things are supposed to transpire. Because again, it's all about the coming of the Messiah. But in this case here, uh, Peter writes in this book, if it's really Peter that wrote it, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what the historical uh, validity of that particular writing is. But um, Peter writes in there, though, that they're going, you know, after the Messiah was killed, crucified, and everything that they would let raise up in the latter days, a fake Messiah. But he does talk about that he comes to his end. And just like we have here, so, so I find this very fascinating as I'm looking at this, and 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 it really totally took me by surprise when I read this because I was not at all uh, had no idea that this was going to happen when I was reading this that day and looking at it and then figure out that you know that this is what this really means. I had totally different ideas about this initially. So. Anyway, before we close out, do you guys have any questions you want to ask? We'll just open it up. Right? There ain't four of us all together here. So let me, we'll stop share here. You can... um, I've got a question. If Jerusalem, Jerusalem will be taken, right? And then they'll bring in the abomination of desolation. How quickly do you think they can erect the physical temple? How fast do you think they can build that? There's, There's been a lot of things, Dave, that, that, that I've heard over the years, even when I lived over there. Um, uh, one guy that I knew claimed that they had already prefabbed the temple uh, and could put it up in just a matter of a few months. Uh, that was wow. what he was telling me. Uh, I know when I lived next door to Gershon Solomon in Jerusalem, you know, he had already cut the cornerstones. Uh, and they were right there in front of my uh, house there where I lived at. Uh, that's how I ended up meeting him because I was thinking to myself, what nut would come out here and cut these big old rocks and just leave them in the street, you know? <laughs> it didn't make any sense. Uh, and Gershon, was he told me that um, the, the guys that cut those stones, it was a uh, family that, that had been there since the time of Jesus. They never left the country. They've always been there all this last 2,000 years. So they would have to be either a Palestinian or a Bedouin family. Uh, he never said that, but you know it's obvious because who else, what, what else would they be considered? And he said they claim to be descendants of the stone cutters of the second temple. Uh, so, and that may very well be, you know, it wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me at all uh, to know that. So, the question is, though, are they going to do it with stones or are they going to do it with, uh, you know, with something else? Uh, like I said, one 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 guy was saying that they already have everything prefab and they could do it again. Uh, the one thing that I'm expecting, though, I'm expecting they're not going to build the temple on the Temple Mount. That's a that's a theory, and I don't hold it as an absolute. It's just a theory. The reason I say that is if you ever, let me see if I can pull up a screenshot for you to show you this here. Um, I'll go to Google Maps. Uh, let's see here. Let's see, I'm gonna go back and share the screen where you guys can see this. We're here in the old city. Got to get my own bearings here, right? Um, all right, yeah, here we go. So your Temple Mount. Let me let me do a see if I can. Looking for where they show you where you could do a um, satellite view. There we go. All right, so you can see the Dome of the Rock right here from like a satellite view. 
Now, typically, uh, I was always told that they would build it right here in between the Dome of the Rock and these buildings that are right here, they're, they've got enough room to actually be able to build it there. That's what I've been told, uh, by, even like by Yehuda Glick, uh, people like that. And But the city of David, what they call the city of David, uh, was discovered outside the walls here. And this is the archaeological site for that, uh, is this area right here. And there's been a lot, whoops, sorry, that's the valley, the Kidron Valley is what that is. Sorry, I'm actually in the wrong spot. Here we go, right here. Um, Wait a minute, let me get to the right place. Nope. Okay. All right, this right here is what they call the city of David. There's a lot of archeological digs in this area here. Those, what looks like buildings there, are just walls and stuff from what they call the city of David. Over here on the opposite side of the street there is also, uh, this is like, um, you, 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 you can walk into this area here, but up underneath there, you, if you go there, you can actually see where some of the archeological ruins are as well. What's interesting to me though, is that um, this here, I think that's the right building, if I'm not mistaken. Let me kind of back out just a little bit here. But we go, no, we want to go to Zion. Here we go. Zion. All right. So the city of David, they, like I said, they've got these archaeological ruins right here. But what's fascinating is that the there is a Catholic church that sits just outside of Zion's Gate. It's that's it right there sits right here on this property here. And they've got a an old city uh, replica somewhere right in here outside of the church there. I can't quite tell from looking at the map now. But what I find fascinating is that the Catholic Church owns all this property in here, right here outside of Mount Zion's Gate. I've wondered if they're not going to end up accidentally one day saying, oh, wow, guess what? We have found where the temple was, and it's actually on one of these sites right here, either right here on this side of the road, which, by the way, that's their driveway that goes down to their uh, facility there. And this whole area is their facility, the parking lot, everything down here. And all this is the church con or the church and the different compounds in there. And because of all the archaeological things that go on there, and by the way, where the church sits is believed to be Caiaphas's house. Uh, there is a, I don't know if I can, I can't get any closer to be able to show that to you, but somewhere right along in here, uh, oh, wait a minute, there, wait a minute uh, okay, yeah, here we go. That, the church is the gray top building on the right. That's the church where they say that Jesus uh, was being scourged by Pilate. And you don't really see it. And that might be it right there. That little white area there um, is like a cobblestone type of uh, set of steps that come up to this, this facility right here. And they claim that they built the church on top of the ruins of Caiaphas's house. Well, if he's the high priest then it would only stand to reason if truly that's where his house was. I don't think that his house would have been, you know, 100 miles away from the temple. Uh, you know, however, however, um, could it have been built up over here on the dome where the Dome of the Rock is now? Sure, it could. Uh, and it's not like that's a long way to walk either, by the way. Uh, and uh, but there are and, and of course, over out here, too. There are a bunch of what we call mikvahs. Uh, mikvahs are ritual baths. Uh, there is a set of steps that go up to this mount right here. And all in these ruins are, are you know, where they've dug up, uh, excuse me, where they've uncovered the uh, ruins there. There are several mikvahs, you know, which are ritual baths where they actually bathe at. But then again, there's also ritual baths back here. Um, 
there's uh, on Zion, what they call Zion's Gate. And again, the, there's a lot of churches that sit right on top of all of this. But in this area right here, uh, there are coming up this back way here, and they, they don't never let people see this, but there are literally mikvahs that are in use. Or there are rabbis going there and they actually use those. And the interesting thing is, this is where they found the artifacts. Um, they call it the First Catholic Church, but it's actually not really the First Catholic Church. There's, um, I don't know, if, I, think it, I think that's the same building right there. All that is is like a little awning over the top of a cave. And in that cave is where they found the artifacts of uh, James, the brother of Jesus, or what they call the brother of Jesus, uh, St. James. They found artifacts that uh, the, the gov Israeli government stole them, and the guy that had, found, that had it, they killed him. Um, but uh, it's an underground thing. It's like a tunnel that goes through this whole area right here and comes way out over here on the other side, over in this area here. Very fascinating place, uh, to say the least. But there are mikvahs where when you're coming up in here, and it's believed that uh, this whole area is where the early apostles used to resort to rather than going up near the temple. Uh, but whether or not they say that the temple was here and end up building the third temple here or not, I don't know. But I just kind of find it interesting that the Vatican owns so much land right here, enough to build a temple without a problem. And there's a lot of people trying to say that this, out here on the outside of the wall there, uh, what they call that city of David, is where the temple actually once stood. There is arguments for that. Um, I don't necessarily say that's correct, but, you know, it, there's a possibility. Who really knows? Uh, I can tell you, though, on the Temple Mount, uh, when I lived there, uh, Roddy, uh, uh, Brother Roddy, we would go underneath. If you go directly straight from the Temple Mount all the way to the front gate here, the uh, where the Tower of David is here, at uh, at this entrance right here at the Jaffa Gate, right directly under this ground here is massive, massive uh, water reservoirs. And it literally is fed, let me see if I can show you this, here we go right there. You'll notice, all right, let's see, the Dome of the Rock is right here. And directly coming up through there, not exactly a straight B line, but the, the way they did it there. But, uh, and then if I were to take you just north of that area, if I can find it on the map here. Um, oh, goodness. Finding it is not always easy, but. I shouldn't say directly north, that's actually east. But there is a massive, massive, uh, here, oh, there, I see it. There it is right here. This right here is, they call it the uh, Memla pool. This is an artificial water reservoir that was built. And literally, there are pipes that have been unearthed going directly in the direction straight there to the Jaffa Gate. And if you'll notice, right, it's right there and directly due east. I mean, it's like a straight line. If you just, I don't know where you can see my curse there. If you just go straight there, it's a straight line, a beeline right to the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock sits uh, to this pool right here. And, uh, and of course, along that way, as like I said, when you come into the Jaffa Gate, let me ease it over real slow because I don't want to mess it up trying to keep it nice and straight there. And, and here we go. All right, now the Jaffa Gate has actually dropped down just a little bit here. Yeah, so, so it's actually a more like a V. It's not a perfect straight line as far as where the, but what it is here, I say the Jaffa Gate, it could still be that the pipeline goes straight to the to the Dome of the Rock, 
but I do know that there are up underneath the uh, Jaffa Gate there. There's also huge cisterns in there, and they and some of these still actually hold water. Uh, you know, I've actually been down in there to them uh, with Roddy Brown, and uh, and have got to see these here. In fact, that's what really got me got my interest peaked when we were doing one time because you know his argument too is that the temple did sit there, and I know there's this big move to say that it didn't. I actually felt strongly more for this too, because in the Hebrew Matthew, when Jesus talks about going to get the, uh, the, 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 the donkey that no man ever sat on, they're actually over here on uh, the Mount of Olives uh, is where they're at. And the way he describes to go get it uh, from the fortress, it's right there on the Mount of Olives where they are. And so, and you can see there the word Mount of Olives is sitting right there. So according to what the Hebrew Matthew declares is that the Roman fortress set on the Mount of Olives and not over here on the other side of the Kidron Valley. So that's one interesting aspect for that. What didn't tell you guys, I'm gonna go into this archeological thing here, but it's kind of fun to see. So the, the point being though, Brother Dave, is I think that, I think that they're going to, um, you know, I mean, th there's any number of places they could do it, but I have heard even from Orthodox rabbis back when I was more part of the Chabad organization, they would talk about, well, we don't have to have the temple right on where the Dome of the Rock is. And I think they would uh, they would try to come up with these ideas because they're afraid that um, they're not going to be able to pull it off like that. I mean, even if even if the Dome of the Rock was blown up, Boy, could you imagine how hard it would be to still build a temple? I mean, the question is, it would be who blew it up? So, and and whether or not, and I mean, Iran, just like Iran just recently did their strike on Israel, you know, yeah, Iran could accidentally blow it up themselves. You know, not to say that they couldn't. Or Israel could take while, they're, while Iran is doing attack, which that's another interesting aspect if you think about it. Did Iran really attack on their own or did Israel just build up the tension so they would attack so that in a future event, Israel could blow up the Dome of the Rock but blame it on Iran, saying that Iran did a strike on Israel again because now that we see that Iran will strike Israel, they could utilize a, a strike against them and then blame it on Iran for the Dome of the Rock being destroyed. So... Just some thoughts to consider. All right. Any other thoughts? Very interesting. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. You're very welcome. So, all right, guys. So we'll close out for tonight then. Brother Ron, I Can I ask you one quick, one more quick question? I was just curious as to on I Connect FX, whatever happened to those videos that you guys put out uh, posted a year or two ago about Trump and the Ashkenazi Jews? I haven't been able to find those. I'll have to look and see. They should still be there uh, because they, they don't should still be there. Okay. Do that. Yeah, they should still be there. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to look for it though, but I'll see if I can find it though. So. Okay. I'm I know it's just it. it's so been... sad to see. But I thought maybe they pulled them down or something. I wanted yeah. to share those with those. Okay, I'll see if I can find them, brother Dave. Can you send me an email just to remind me? And yes. uh, you know what? We'll use the, let me see. Use Stephen at IsraeliNewsLive.org. Stephen at IsraeliNewsLive.org. Okay. Right. And Brother Ron, we're, uh, I'll, I gotta, when I get back to Tennessee, we've got to try to get this interview pulled together. So it's on my mind a lot to do this interview with you. And I just, I just keep thinking about it and I want to get that. I really want to do that. So I don't know how you keep up with what you're doing. <laughs> I don't either. I, I promise you, I don't. So, is, am I here? God, God bless you, brother. Thank you. Appreciate all your work. You, thank you, brother Dave. God bless you. So, but anyway, uh, we'll get together though. If you would, remind, reach out to me or something, text me or something this week, uh, maybe around Wednesday or so. We're, I'm doing an interview with, uh, uh, for you guys, so you just so you know, 
uh, with Phil Turner, I think it's Phil Tur Turner, Turney, and then also with uh, Ron uh, Kukow, I think is how you say Ron's last name. They're both uh, survivors from the USS Liberty. And uh, I'm supposed to do an interview with them uh, this coming week as well. So that ought to be a little bit interesting. I've talked talked to Ron quite extensively. He was a chaplain on the USS Liberty when it was when it was attacked. And uh, you know, I've heard so much about that that particular story and stuff, you know, but hearing it from I, even from Israeli Mossad, I've heard about that. And they admit, yes, we were going to sink it. So, um, and they, I did find out, which was always my suspicion, uh, and according to Ron, he said that pretty much all the survivors that he knows felt the same thing. The intention was to sink it. He said that they basically wanted to start World War III, but they wanted to sink it and blame it on Egypt and say that the Egyptians sunk the ship. That's what he said the original thing. He said that's what they had finally figured out why they had attacked them, is that they wanted the... They wanted to make it look like the Egyptians did that. And of course, the people in Mossad that I knew, I say knew because the elder, you know, they killed him. Uh, he was an Egyptian Israeli. So, and he was back during that time. And uh, so, yeah, I said it was definitely meant to, to be sunk. They wanted to justify World War III. And they wanted to be able to get the United States in to help them by saying the Egyptians sunk your ship and uh, so now we have to go after the bad guys. That's what they were doing it for. So that's that's going to be an interesting interview to bring that out. So, all right. God bless you guys. God bless Sister Deb. Thank you, Brother Steve. You're welcome. Good night, guys.